this is Chuck from Monocoque Metalworks. I'm here tonight with a very special E-Type. Now, I know I've said that before, but this car really is very special for a number of reasons. Not the least of which is the fact that this is my own personal outside bonnet latch project. Now, this car is available for sale as a project for restoration. I've had this car for about seven years, and I'm gonna talk all about that, but I have too many projects. I've got three very active teenagers and a busy family, and something's gotta go. It's time for this one to find a new home where it can be restored and brought back to its former glory. This car was one of the first cars to be exported into Canada. And if you look, it still has its original painted wire wheels, which is common for an outside lock car, but an absolute necessity for a Canadian export. They all had painted wires. And then you'll see I put on the amber lenses. That is what this would have originally come with as well. This car was built on June 13th. 1961 so very early it is just after the 100 mark of the left hand drive roadsters and when you look at the engine numbers and body numbers around that they didn't make very many other e-types um right hand drive roadsters and then coupes when they had made this so it's just about the hundredth car made this car was originally opalescent dark green with a maroon interior and a slate top. Uh, right now, it's in a black primer to protect it, but um, we'll go through all of that, and I do still have some of the original paint showing on the back. But one of the coolest things about this car is that after a lot of research and digging through photos and details, I am 99% certain that this E-Type is this E-Type. This photo has been popping up periodically on Jaguar Facebook groups, forums, E-Type pages for the past, I don't know, 10 or more years. I probably saw this for the first time about 10 years ago. It shows a man and a woman standing on the bonnet of an early outside bonnet latch E-type, apparently looking at a race somewhere. Now, we'll get back to this photo in a minute. Before we do, let's talk about some facts that we know about this car. This is a copy of the Jaguar Heritage Certificate that the previous owner sent away for. Now, I have removed his name and his street number, and I have also taken the last couple of digits off the chassis number and the engine number because I don't like to share that information with anyone other than the new owner. But otherwise, this heritage certificate is untouched, and you can see it's one of the older heritage certificates. It used to be a little fancier, and it was in more of a landscape than a portrait mode. But it shows that this car was originally opalescent dark green with a maroon interior. I'm sorry, earlier I had said that it had a slate top, but it had a gunmetal top. But there's the build date of June 13th, 1961, and it was sent out of the UK on June 28th, 1961. It went straight over to Jaguar Cars of Eastern Canada in Montreal, Canada. And what's nice about this is it does show the first owner, J.F. Isard. I guess that's how you say it. It also shows Oakville and what I assumed was California. I'm an American guy, so when I see Oakville, comma, C.A., I assume it's Oakville, California. And for the first few years I had the car, it was a mystery to me as to why a car that was sold in Montreal, Canada, would be sold to someone who lives in California and then make its way back to Canada, which is where I purchased it from. But if I was a Canadian, I would have assumed, rightfully so, that it was a town Oakville in Ontario, Canada, right on the edge of Lake Ontario, just below Toronto. 
And so once I figured that out, I went ahead and tried to find information on somebody named J.F. Isard in that town. Now, over here is a copy of the 1947 phone book for Oakville, Ontario. And if you look on line 840 there in the middle, you can see John F. Isard lived at 108 Dundas Road or Street, and his phone number was 216. A little more digging around on the internet led me to this page of a newspaper a few years later, and it shows a John F. Isard as a barrister or a solicitor with an office located on 142 Colborne Street East. And here you can see he's got a business phone number of 15. This was a while ago in a small Canadian town. And his residential number is 216, which was the residential number in that phone book from a few years ago. So this is the same person. A little more digging on the internet led me to this Google image of the building at 142 Lakeview Drive, which is the new name for Colborne Street in Oakville, Ontario. 142 is the pink building that you see here. It's obviously an old building. And so you can just imagine John's new E-type parked right out in front of this building. And if you use your imagination a little more, you can picture him closing up the shop at the end of the day, walking across the sidewalk, jumping in his E-type, and heading right down Colborne Street. If you're having trouble imagining what that would have looked like, I just happened to find a postcard of Colborne Street in the 1960s. And this is really cool. It's got a little bug eye sprite there. It's obviously the 60s cars. Maybe that's him walking across the street. A few years went by after I purchased the car and this photo finally popped up on one of the Facebook groups again. And now that I actually owned an outside bonnet lock E-Type, I paid it a little more attention, I guess. And that's when I noticed that the car had amber turn signals. And I realized that that would only be true of a car that was going somewhere other than the United States. And I already knew that my car had originally been sold into Canada, and so I kind of sat up and took a little better look at the photo. It also looked like the wire wheels are not as shiny as the knockoff in the center of them or the headlamp trim or the front bumpers. So they really do look like painted wires as well in the photo. And when I started to mention this to my wife and just kind of kid around how cool it would be if this was my car, she is the one who said, well, I can tell you, I grew up on the border of Canada, and that is definitely a case of Molson beer. That's when I really started trying to do some homework. Because initially, I thought, this looks a lot like Watkins Glen with these rolling hills. And maybe the person that owned this car back in the early 60s drove down to Watkins Glen and watched a race, which wouldn't be uncommon for Canadians who were into sports cars. But about a year later, the picture popped up again. And there's always lots of comments, most of them talking about how you shouldn't stand on the car. And somebody posted, this is definitely Mossport, which is the Canadian track north of Toronto where they would run Grand Prix races. And a few other people chimed in and confirmed that suspicion. And the general consensus was that this photo was taken in the outfield somewhere between turns two and three. And that's when I started to get really excited. Because one of those people also said, I don't remember there being a black E-type in Eastern Canada at this time. 
it looks to me like the car might actually be dark green. And I had kind of thought that before, that maybe because of the bad coloring of this old photo, that maybe it was a dark green car. So now, if you start to look at a map of eastern Canada, Mossport is about one hour north of Oakville. And I purchased the car in London, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half west. So the area where the photo was taken, where the car was originally sold to, and where I picked it up, are all within a radius of about 100 miles. So, of course, I'm telling people about this, and I would mention it every once in a while, and it was my father-in-law who eventually said, that is definitely an Ontario license plate. Now, Ontario would change their license plate colors every year. And in the early 60s, they would go back and forth every year between black on white and white on black. But the 1962 plate was black lettering on a white background. And you can see it has a little crown in the center at the top. And it really looks like this plate has that. I know it's hard to see. The picture isn't the best. And it's kind of under the grass. But it really looks like that 1962 Ontario plate. And the 1964 plate actually looked just like it. But if you look at the photo, the paint on this car is glossy and flawless. There is not a single dent or scratch in it. This car is brand new. And so there they are standing on it, watching a race at Mossport with an Ontario plate on the front, probably 1962, and a Molson beer and a case of Molson beer sitting on the bonnet with amber turn signals and painted wires on a dark colored outside lock car. Now, I don't have any way of knowing that this is definitely a photograph of this car, and maybe it's not. But if it isn't, it's another E-type just like it that was in Eastern Canada at this time. So it's really fun to look at the picture and think about that and just imagine the adventures that this car went through between when that photo was taken 62 years ago and today. I found out about this car originally eight years ago, right when we were building out this new shop. One of my customers in Canada called and he was ordering some panels for his 63 coupe. And he mentioned that I have a Roadster parts car, but every time I wanna use a part off of it, it's not the same as my car because it's one of those really early cars. And I said, hmm, I'd like to hear a little more about that. And so after about a year of going back and forth, he was busy, I was busy. I confirmed what it was. We went ahead and made a deal and I went and got it. There's that original paint and we'll come back to that. So I have had the car for seven years it was an incomplete, quote unquote, parts car when I got it. And I have spent those seven years gathering up the pieces that were missing, which is not easy for an outside bonnet latch car. These cars all have very specific pieces. The first 500 cars were built out of orders of 500 of every part. And then by the time they got done building them, they decided that just about every part needed to be changed. So it's tough to find the pieces for this, but I have gathered them all up except maybe a small handful, and I'll tell you what they are. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Coming up front, we've got all original chrome. These are 3.8 bumpers. They are excellent. They're almost too good to re-chrome. And then you've got some original overriders there, motif ears, motif bar, turn signals that are in good shape. Those, of course, are um, 
just reproduction lenses that I put on there to make the car show a little better. These are Lexan headlamp lenses and some original chrome, but you are going to get a complete set of new old stock headlamp glass and chrome, and I will show you that later on. That's over on the bench. Now, one thing about the earliest cars is if you look, this is your standard reproduction amber lens, and they call these lines here fluting, and this is cross hatching. But this car would have been fluted all the way like that. So these will be included, and when you restore this car, you will dissect this lens. Those two pieces are just glued together, and you will glue these in, maybe clean it up a little more. Okay, here you can see the outside lock latch. I always confuse those two terms, but it originally had a little teardrop piece on it like that. And inside, on the side of the console, was what they call a T-handle. Other British cars had this, Triumphs and things. And you would stick this in here like this and just give it a quarter turn. And that's how you open the bonnet. Okay, on the bonnet, I left the spring and scissor assemblies off so that I could open it extra far for this video. So it's just resting on the floor. There are the welded in louver panels. Of course, it's also got all welded in flanges. And then here are, this is actually the original outside latch uh, mechanism from this car. So there's that. Here's the other side. This was a little rustier. And then this is the early style fiberglass plenum that would have been painted the same color as the car. So just assembled and then painted over green. Okay. There is a lot to talk about in here. Everything's different. And what I did do, I had the foresight to make a video of all the engine details before I put the engine in. So a couple of months ago, I had the engine up on the frame table and I did a very extensive video on it. And we're gonna go to that next. But before that, we'll talk about the things around the engine. This is the original washer bottle you can see it's been out but somebody cut that but that's the cut matches right up this is the original washer bottle the date is on the back side it is 561 may of 61 you can barely see it you have to wet it down and wipe it to see that this is the original wiper motor and right there you can see 361 so they put that together in march here is the early style uh, air cleaner plenum there, this fiberglass piece. It is smooth. You've got the black air cleaner can down there. Now, originally these cars had a smaller data plate. You can see I've covered up the last two digits of the chassis number and the engine number. I don't like to give away my numbers, however, you can see, and I restamped this. This is the same as an XK150 plate because it didn't have a plate. So I put this on there. The body number is R1124. So this is the 124th Roadster body produced. There is the body tag. This is where it is on an outside lock car. So R1124. And then they also would stamp that into the bonnet. And there is that original bracket with the original stamping, 1124. So that all matches up. Now, normally I'd cover up part of this chassis number as well, but it has rusted to the point where you can't see it anymore. But you will notice that it is up against the very front edge of the picture frame, and that is how the early cars were done. This car would have originally had the early style finned aluminum Marston radiator. They are almost impossible to find in usable condition. And so my plan was to use the readily available reproduction, which looks just like it and will hold pressure. So that's what I recommend here. It's one of the very few things that are missing from this car. Okay, going up front, you can see that this is an original 
outside bonnet lock style header tank. It's got the thin edge and it's got the tube going right into the corner of the tank instead of the side. There's the original 3.8 liter bracket there. Now I did have to make repairs to the bonnet carrier bracket. Basically I couldn't save the original. So I made one up out of pieces from a later uh, bonnet carrier and then you can see that is the original front cross shaft see it does not have a little tab for the front license plate bracket and then that lower valance does not have a hole in it for that either these are original early outside lock hinge pieces those aluminum pieces see they're thin there and then they're also very curved on the end and of course it is a studded uh piece that comes out of the bonnet carrier this car will need new frame rails we can get those for you and we can have those made up identical to what this originally had the front suspension is all original this car so is the steering um, most of that is the same as your average 3.8 liter e-type i believe that the brake caliper pistons are different but they are original we talked about the painted wire wheels before, and these are the original wheels from this car. I believe this is the original spare because this is a Dunlop Road Speed RS5 black wall, which is what this car would have come from the factory with. So I imagine this was the original spare, and as you can see, they got their money's worth out of this tire and then some. Now, we talked about the suspension. This car also has its complete original rear suspension. Lots of things are different about that. The pieces in it are worth a fortune, and they're all there. Okay, there's a little more to see over here. Here is that much more primitive breather setup that the outside lock cars had. It's just a piece of corrugated aluminum tubing that comes out of the breather and goes right down to the ground. These are the original brake bottles from this car. You can see that they have the early style Nevo code tops. They are impossible to get. There they are. This is the original complete brake pedal box setup. It's got all the original master cylinders on it. Down there is one of the tags, and I believe it says 529.61. So they put that together right before they got the car off the assembly line. This is an early heater. It's got the early style side plate. It's got the narrow piece here. The original heater for this car was completely rusted away, but this is the original heater motor from this car. That is all original to this car. So is the RB310 voltage regulator. Real quick, I also forgot to mention in that video that as this is all original to this car, that is the Kelsey Hayes power booster instead of the later Dunlop style. This is the engine for my personal outside bonnet latch Roadster. My car is just after the 100 car mark, so it's still a very early car. And these engines, they look just like an E-Type engine, but almost every single part on them is a little bit different because those first 500 cars were almost kind of a pre-production prototype run. And after they got through those first 500 cars and needed to order more parts, it seems like they determined that every single part on the car needed to be changed or upgraded in some way. So <clears throat> it's a lot of fun to go through these. You can see, I don't know if you can see in there, but I've got the books out. I've got the reading glasses because there's a lot of little fine details. And so I'm just going to walk you through this and try to cover as many of the features as I can. There's a lot of guys who are really into these early cars. Um, obviously, there's been books written about it and everything. And I just, I love the automotive archaeology. The, uh, the originality crowd used to drive me crazy when I was younger. I don't know. I guess you grow into it or maybe you just get sucked into it when you're around these cars so much. 
But that's enough of you standing there looking at me. I'm gonna get behind the camera and I'm just gonna walk you through this and try to cover as many parts of it as I can. Well, I guess we'll just start here real quick. These are the two big books for E-Type originality. The one on the left is the Haddock and Mueller book. This is really the updated version of a book they wrote, I mean, 25, 30 years ago. I do know both Tom and Mike. Uh, Tom was just spoken to on the phone a couple of times. Mike, um, the first time I met him was actually at Spring Carlisle Import Show. And he had, they had just finished this book and we were all, you know, a lot of all the E-type guys were in a, like a bar and grill in town and he whipped out this book and I just, it, it blew my mind that somebody would go to this detail. It had never really occurred to me. So it was really neat to see that. And we sat there and ate hamburgers and drank beer and everybody was pawing all over it and looking at it. So that's, that's that book. Then a couple years ago, actually during COVID, Malcolm McKay contacted me about some details for this book. What he really needed were photographs of parts. And we have a large collection of E-type parts up here. I actually just straightened up a little bit and it, it's not as fun up there anymore because all the stuff's in boxes. Used to just be this attic of stuff strewn around. But anyway, I have a lot of stuff up there. So when he needed pictures of parts and, and certain parts out of cars, he called me and, and we had a lot of fun going through this and I actually ended up getting really involved in this. So, you know, my little claim to fame was that he, he wrote me a personal note in this book and then I actually got a preface here, which was really cool because to, to have a, a little write-up on the same page as Philip Porter was, was pretty cool. <laughs> so there's, there's the two books. Um, there are others. This is actually the second big version of this book. I think they might have redone this after this. And I told you that we had a lot of pictures in here. If you look on this page here... See, here's a photograph that we took just on the concrete floor behind me of two 3.8 gearboxes showing the different uh, mounting points back there. This gearbox on the left is this gearbox. This is the gearbox that's in the book. So I guess we'll get started there and we'll move forward. Now let me get resituated. Okay. This is a Moss four-speed box. Some people call it a crash box because it's a non-synchro first. This is one of the gear boxes off one of the first 500 outside latch cars. I, I don't like to give away my numbers. You can see I've taped off the number, but as you can see by the size of the tape, it is a small number. Now, one thing about these boxes is all these bolts in here are um, the British threads. They are not standard threads, so you can't just run a fine thread bolt in there. And it's, it's interesting because this one had a mix of bolts in it. We've got some Newell bolts up here. You've got your standard GKN bolts, which are very popular on the early E-types and actually all E-types that are Series 1s. And then back here, you've got some B's bolts, so quite a mix on this one. You can see it has a casting date, and this is the British date format so you've got day month year so that is may 19th of 1961 uh back here it it, ha it doesn't have the spring mount that you see on most e-types it's got the early two stud mount and this is the early mount from this car and it's different than other early mounts they decided to beef this up and so not too long after the outside lock cars, this little ear is bigger and it comes down that way. These are original metalastic mounts that go in there. You can see they've got the, uh, I don't know if you can see the word metalastic, but it's on there. Oh, there it is right there. And see, it's got these big steel pieces there. The, the reproductions don't look anything like that. So I don't know if they're any good, but that's, that's what they are. All right, so here's the gearbox. You can see it's got this square flange on the back. This is an original shift lever. Sorry, I get a little tangled up in my words because I'm going so fast, so I'll try to, try to limit that. 
Um, over here, we've got the original uh, style slave cylinder. And you've got all the mechanism there for the hydraulic clutch. And then this bell housing is what they had on the earliest outside lock cars. This is a bell housing that they were using on other Jags of the period. It does not have this cone shape that comes out. So usually this is a big lump here, but instead it's just this straight little thing because the, the way this starter is designed, it doesn't have that nose cone on the starter. So you don't need the clearance. So this is what an outside lock car has there. You can see this is the engine stabilizer mount and there's your GKN bolt for it. I guess I will just go ahead and say now that every nut, bolt, screw, washer, everything on this engine is absolutely perfect for what it is. I have gone to great lengths to make sure of that. And then here's another complete original engine stabilizer assembly down there. Okay, so right now, and you probably saw that the freeze plugs are out, this engine is simply mocked up and ready for rebuilding and restoration. Everything's cleaned, but none of the uh, original coatings or treatments have been moved off or sandblasted off or anything like that. So we can identify what color things were painted, how the coatings were on, is it nickel, is it chrome, is it you know regular brass, uh, is it black anodized? And so that was the idea here, to get it all assembled, make sure it's all there, make sure it's all good, and a, kind of a little lesson in originality. So we'll go ahead and start with the block. The earliest cars had a very particular block, and you can see right here in the book, You've got a cast-in number of C17523 with a dot in it. And there it is right there. C.17523. And it wasn't too long after this that maybe even later in the um, outside lock run, they started doing it this way. I don't really know why, but I see a lot of early 61 and 62 blocks that look like that. So there's that. All right. And then over here, you've got a casting date on these blocks and then like a casting code. And so the earliest cars have an M2 code and then a casting date that should correspond. Now, this is a June car. It came off right in the middle of June. And so over here, you'll see here's our M2 foundry code. And then this is a April 13th casting. So we're right in line there. It takes about two months from the time it was cast to the time the car came off the line. So that's, that's about the block. I guess we'll just talk real quick. The oil pan is, of course, the early smooth style oil pan. Um, I'm in this area, so we'll talk about this is the oil filter housing. And, and this was tough to get. You know, there were some parts missing off of this when I put it together. Getting the, the right can here for canister, I guess you call it, for the cartridge oil filter. There must be 30 different versions of this thing and how it's made and what the end looks like and then what the bolt looks like and the length of the bolt and the threads and all of that. So this is just right. This washer is actually bigger than the bolt shaft and there's a little kind of rubber hard plastic spacer in there. But there's your, uh, there's your oil filter housing. Back here on the starter, this is the starter from another outside lock car. I know where it came from. It's actually a car that's earlier than this. You can see that it's got a date on it of June of 1960. So this thing's been sitting on the shelf for a year before it finally made its way into an outside lock car. And you can't really see the part number, but it's, it's got the right part number. All right, real quick back here. There's your tack generator. You got a little blanking plate back here. I was surprised to see that these were just little copper washers. You've got your, I think those are bees bolts. Yep. These are just little copper washers. That's what was on there. 
And then over here on your tack generator, very difficult to find one of these with the original little Bakelite housing here that's not all broken and mashed and these things are usually twisted up. So that's in great shape there. Okay, let's go to the front for a minute. The earliest cars had a different pulley arrangement and a different generator and all of that. So this car has the correct upper and lower aluminum pulleys. Most 3.8 cars, after about the first 400, they went to a cast pulley down here with a wider single V-belt. And so the water pump pulley is aluminum on all of those cars. It looks just like this, except the V is wider, so it won't work. I mean, I probably should have pulled some of that stuff down to compare, but you can go to the books and look at all of that. But these are the correct pulleys for an early outside lock car. And then here is the matching generator pulley. You can see everything's right in line there. All right. Now, this car would not have had a tensioner, but they ran into a lot of problems with that because the belts quickly stretch. There actually is a slot under this bolt, although it is, you can see that the washer is covering the slot. It's that small. So you ran out of movement, not only in this slot, but also you bumped into the frame rail because this generator is bigger in diameter than the later uh, regular 3.8 generator. So you very quickly bumped into the frame rail. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep this steady. Um, but you know, when I talk, I move with my hands, so I wiggle around. Um, but anyway, so they quickly decided, all right, we need to keep this all still and put a tensioner in. So I've included the tensioner, may or may not use it, probably will. It was very common for the tensioner to be added to these cars, and I think it was a um, bulletin, like an upgrade. All right, coming around here, here is the generator. It is much more like an XK car, and it even has the same XK bracket down there. And then again, you can see we've got all the original B's bolts on that. We've even got the uh, correct bolts on, I think they're B's, they're a little bit dirtier. Yeah, they are, the B's bolts down there on the engine mount brackets, and then there are the correct engine mount brackets there. Now, this generator is one of the few, if not the only things on this engine that is not correct. The housing is correct, this is it, that's what the tail looks like, that's all right, but the part number is wrong and the date is wrong. I didn't have one that was right for this, so, Visually and uh, dimensionally, it's the same, but we're probably gonna eventually upgrade to one of those. And people have them, but they, they just want a fortune for them. <laughs> These are the 1961 exhaust manifolds. They look just like all the rest, but the casting, when you get into the later ones, you'll see there's a, like a little funny diamond-shaped casting on here for the foundry. That is on these, but it's on the back side. Usually it's, it's right up front here. So these are 61 manifolds. So then you can look at the porcelain coating. It's almost got kind of a grayish, and I don't know if that has come in from where, or that's how the early ones were, but these are the legit early ones. And so you can see they have this little bump here for the donut instead of a flange on the earlier cars. Uh, they have brass nuts up here with a little lock washer, and those are all 5 16 And then you'll see all the studs on this engine have that little kind of, I don't know, bump, tit sticking out on the end. That's how the original studs are. You want to look for that. And then these brass nuts have a little row of either circles or maybe the letter O. You see that? Got to get it focused here. See that right there? So that's original. It's very common to see these big wide brass nuts used on restorations. That's not correct. This is the real thing here. All right. Uh, let's take a breather and go over to the other side. All right. Here's the other side. I'm going to try to use my pointing hand less and just point with the camera. We could probably talk about these carburetors and intake for an hour, but I'll try to hit everything that I can think of. 
This is the early 1961 linkage setup. This is what was used on all the outside lock cars and a lot of the flat floor cars, if not all of them. That you can see that there are three stand-ups here on the um, air rail instead of two on the later style. And they got rid of this linkage because this linkage is just not good. There are too many options for things to loosen up. So see, you've got these little ears there and they're pinched on. Um, notice that that one is the original coating. I don't know how well it'll show up on the video, but see these two down here have lost their nickel coating, but they are brass with a nickel on them. And then here is the connector piece there. This is just another thing that can come loosened up, but those are all the original little bolts on that. Now, your linkage arms that go down, this is actually a lot like, if not identical, to an XK150 setup. But that linkage there, see how it has that little kick in it? You need that for the E-type setup. The 150s are just straight there. But see, you need that little kink so it lines up. All right? So that's that. We'll stay up top here and talk about the water rail. Uh, people are real big on talking about th how this dips down here. Well, we had a car in here last summer that was a virgin, untouched, unrestored outside latch car. And it was 20 cars earlier than this. And it had the same rail that this has, just the standard flat rail. So it was less than 100 cars that had that dip in there. And I just talked to somebody that said it was more like 40. So this is correct for this car. Um, this little blanking plate here, I don't know if I'll be able to get on them, but these are the Linreed screws up there. They're actually coarse thread because they're going into a aluminum housing. This is the original temperature sender there. And you can see that it's brass, but also has a nickel coating. Now this whole thing is put together with fine thread 5 16 nuts. They're used here on the head and then all these rails and here. All of these nuts are of this style. I don't know if I can, yeah, look down in there. There is a row of the letter P on them. And I don't have, I, you have to take this whole thing off to get it up in the car. So that's just on there with a couple. Actually, let's take a look at this one here. Oh, come on, focus for me. There you go, it's upside down. But see that row of the letter P? Obviously, that row of P's was in the base material when the nuts were made, and then they were just sliced off. But then also on this nut, see how the back side up against the engine is dead flat, and then the front side has rounded corners. Now, a lot of times you'll see where someone has put the nut on and off backwards, and there'll be gouges in it from the lock washers. Of course, these lock washers are that... I don't want to say standard kind, but they're the kind you see on Jags where they're a little bit smaller than the nut. All right, so come back here. Same deal. This is, this is all original here with the original uh, copper washer. This little air tube extension piece there is original, original nuts and washers there. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the carburetors themselves. These are original early SU HD8 two inch carburetors. And they've been taken apart. Everything inside's been checked. They've been oiled. Again, not rebuilt or restored. Just everything in there made sure that it's excellent. You can see everything moves. That's all good. And then all of the pistons are good. Okay. And then these are a match set of early carbs. They have the correct date code on them. And then you'll also notice that this little tab right there is thinner than will be on later carbs. So that also indicates that they are early carburetors. The dash pots are in good shape. There's not any big gouges or anything. Someone did just put a little tiny scratch of one two, three. People love to do that, but it's not deep enough. It'll come right out. All right. The, the little dash pot dampers here are the early style with the brass, and then they've got that letter O or zero in them. 
All right, all the screws and everything are the same. The overflow tubes are an early set. They've still got the CAD coating on them. And then they are long. They shortened up over the years until they eventually got real short. But they're long and they've got that little bracket in there. You can see that the fuel feed line also has the cadmium coating on it that's original. So we just, it's starting to rust away there. But you can see what it was. All right, over here on the fuel bowl lids, they are the early style. So they all have this little hole here with a, you know, an actual hole in it, although it doesn't really go anywhere. But then these are blind, there are two more blind holes. And then on these early ones, they have those three lumps, holes, whatever you want to call them. And then the SU script is different and the letters S and U are a little closer together. All right. Then up here, we've got these tags and they say AUC 946. You'll see that one says R for the rear. And then you come over here. This one says C for the center. And then this one here says F for the front. All right. What else can we talk about on the cars? Here is the vacuum line for the vacuum advance. It is an original line. It's got the original fittings on the end, and it's got a screw fitting down here. Later, they actually just went to a little rubber elbow, but this is the early style with the screw fittings on both ends. All right. I know as soon as I end this video, I'll think of a bunch of other things I was supposed to mention about the carbs and all that, but I think that about covers it for the early carburetors. All right, now up here, the head is was rebuilt. That's why it doesn't have any paint on it. And it actually was painted red at some point. You can see that it's an R1 head very early. It's nine to one compression. And you can see that there's a little dash there. Not long after this, they started putting a one there sideways. I, I think they might've just lost the dash or just got sick of it, or they probably used it to take something apart, who knows? But the early cars all have that little dash like they should. And then you've got the little foundry mark in here that's an A. You can see it's a little out of whack and messed up. They all look like that, that's how they were. Um, we've got the chrome D washers and the um, chrome acorn nuts there holding the studs. This car does not have engine lift pieces on it and it wasn't too long after that they decided to just start leaving them on there but the outside lock cars do not have it all right cam covers are good without any big gouges they're going to be able to be polished up nicely we've got our little chrome acorn nuts there with the little copper washers all right up front here is the coil and the breather. Now you'll see the breather doesn't have that crazy thing that goes up and over. It just goes out and it goes to this side because on this car and the XKs, there's just a corrugated aluminum tube that hooks right to this with a chainy hose clamp. It comes down through the frame rail and goes straight to the ground. Um, and down there, it's always all oily on these outside lock cars. It's actually held to the frame rail with a piece of wiring loom strap. But then you'll note that this points up like this. See, on all the other cars, they just took this same casting and flipped it around. So then they had to have this little 90 degree bracket to get back to where this needs to be for the coil. But it was originally designed to work this way. All right, there's the coil. You can see I don't have the right date on this. This one's from 1958, I think. You need to find one there from early 61 that will be right. And by the time this gets restored, I'm sure we will have found that. So there's the coil bracket there. Um, inside the engine, it has the rotating assembly that is original to this block. So it's got the crank, rods, all of that, the, the harmonic balancer. It does have the early style crankshaft. They changed the 3.8 crank. Not sure exactly when they changed it, but the outside lock cars have the early crank. So it's got that. Flywheel is the correct E-type flywheel for a 3.8. It's lighter than the other sedans. 
Uh, you know, like I said, you could go on and on with this. Oh, finally, the you'll see that the freeze plugs are out. That's so we could check to make sure everything's good with the block and it's rebuildable. You can see straight through. There is some corrosion in there, but it's pretty much typical for an E-Type. It's uh, not all packed full, so that's good. The distributor, it is correct. I don't think this is an original distributor cap, although it might be, I can't remember. But the distributor is the correct part number. I think it has a May date code. Unfortunately, that is turned around back so you can't see it. And then it's got all the correct uh, hold down stuff, correct bolts. All the little bolts here are correct. I cleaned every one of these with a toothbrush. <laughs> So, you know, they are B's or GKN. A lot of people like to talk about the B's bolts, but B's bolts are really an XK thing. Most of the bolts that you see on the early E-types are GKN, even these outside latch cars. But uh, this, the engine assemblies do have a lot of B's bolts on them. Okay, moving back. This is an original clear triplex windshield. You can see it has some scratches in it. I don't know if you can polish those out or not. These are the correct early wiper blades. There's a big discussion between whether or not they should be aramid blades. These are rainbow blades. In my research, this is what this car should have. If you really want to argue about it, I'll throw in some original aramid blades too but these are also correct early uh, wiper arms. Now, originally these cars had a fat piece of lower windshield chrome. That I do not have. I know someone who does have it. They have the clips too. This piece is the same. And so you can go ahead and put the wide chrome in with the clips and then it'll clip right onto there and cover up that point and you're good to go. This car is early enough that it does not have the little stepped uh, upper door chrome here. It's got the flat style like this has here. All of the gauges and dash panels are original to this car. This car originally, look, it's, it looks like it's going 90 when it's standing still. This car originally had a 331 rear. That's the correct speedometer that matches that. These are all the original gauges and center panel. Then you can see this has an early style Playmate radio. And if you look on the cover of the Mueller and Haddock book, that's the exact same radio on the cover. And I believe the cover car for that book is number 26. These seats are in excellent condition. They've got a little bit of surface rust, but otherwise they are great. They are the earliest style seats. These are red. Originally, this car says it had a maroon interior. So you don't really know with the way Jaguar wrote things down, whether it was actually maroon or kind of red, but um, those the seats are excellent. You'll see later, I have the seat rails. They're over there on the table. This is all early style dot pattern aluminum. You may or may not want to restore that or just replace it. It's got the early plastic uh, gearbox tunnel cover back there. And this is also an early dash top here. It's got its original fuel lid here and then it opens up a little creaky. This is an original gas cap. I'm pretty sure this is correct for that. It's pretty simple. And then you look in there, the drain is in the, oh, it's kind of dark in there. The drain is in the front instead of the back. And they moved the drain from there to there because it didn't work there. So that's just another one of these early outside latch features. I mentioned before that the car was opalescent dark green it always was green it was green when i got it uh lots of different colors of green and surface rust but i have sanded down and it was painted over so you can see that this is green on top of green with like a layer of primer or sealer in between this is the original paint and you can tell that by this telltale jaguar pattern of three layers of primer primer slash sealer 
What Jaguar did to smooth the cars out was just spray them multiple times with a primer sealer. And so you always see this red, white, gray pattern underneath the original paint. So this is the original paint. I'll hit it with a wet rag there so you can see what it looks like. It's the, the metallic shows up a little better when it's wet. And you can also see that it's darker and looks a lot closer to black like we talked about when we were looking at that picture. Now coming around back, you can see that it has not suffered any major collisions back here, although the deck lid has pretty much had it. These are the original rear bumpers. This chrome is original. It's the original reverse lamp. I did put these uh, turn signals on. They were gone, but these are from another 61 Roadster. Now, if we open up in here, you can see it is not pretty inside. Lots of rust. There's holes. But this is car is early enough so that it has the two-piece ribs there. And it also has the riveted-in reverse lamp blister. Now, under here, you're going to have that early style of submersible fuel pump. And then up here, you'll see it has the early double hinge. What's very interesting about this is that this car is 20 cars later than the one we had in here last summer. That car had the single early style. This car has the double. So somewhere in there is where they changed it. The top frame is the correct early top frame. You can see that it has all the original gray paint on it. The doors are not complete at the moment, but all of the parts to make them complete are behind me on the bench, and I'm going to be showing you all of that. This is the original steering wheel and center cap to this car. The facing wood is gone, but the piece of wood on the back side is still there. I just kind of taped it on if you want to experiment and see what kind of wood it was, etc. Coming around here, you'll see that it has the early style windshield post caps. This is what they look like on the later cars. I think they did that to seal out the water a little better. But this is the early style. And then that little hole there had a screw and a piece of rubber on it. All right. As I mentioned earlier, the car is assembled so that you can see that everything's there and that I can also see that everything's there. But there are some pieces that are going to go along with it that aren't on there. This is an original radiator shroud. Someone has painted it black. I don't know why. You can see that the, the uh, silver hammer tone is under it. But this is the only one upstairs out of about a dozen that is not cracked, ripped, or chipped around the edges. Then here's an original radiator screen. It's all complete and it's straight. You can see it's still in the um, original gray paint. Here are some of the interior pieces that you do end up needing that don't usually come in the kit. So these would be recovered. You got your windshield posts and your door tops. There's some little pieces that go back behind the top when it's down. This is the original radiator mount piece from the original bonnet carrier bracket. And I did fix that up so I could get the bonnet on there. You're going to want to replace that. But this should go along with it because this shows that it did not have that beaded stiffening rib in it. And it also doesn't have the uh, piece they put on that's kind of a spot welded piece that stiffens it. So this is the absolute most earliest style. And then I just threw this in here. This is the original uh, little radiator shield down there. You can see it's got the overspray of the green paint like they all do. This is two sets of original plug wires from early cars. Now, this one is going to have your original ends that go in the distributor. It's got all of the original little Bakelite spacers there. And then over here, it's got the little mounting clip. This mounts onto the nut of one of the cam covers as it comes up and over. And then there's a little piece for that. This one has the original early style spark plug ends and you can see it says champion it's got that little round dot unfortunately there's only five out of the six here but you should be able to dig one of those up but these are the originals from an outside lock car all right here's a nice straight reaction plate 
Uh, this is a very nice original set of lever roll 3.8 uh, seat sliders, but these are from a little bit later. I only have one of the original outside lock style, and you can see here where the mounting holes were a little bit shorter in between them and it didn't have as much movement. And then over here on the end, you're probably not going to be able to see very well. But there are two different styles of um, leveral markings on here. And then this is the early style. So this one will go with it. I would probably use those because you get more movement out of the seat. But that's, that goes with it there. Here's an original 3.8 uh, vacuum reservoir tank. It's got all the hoses and the little mounts. And it's got the original valve here. Um, you can tell it's a 3.8 because it's not full of brake fluid. Only the 4.2s do that. This is a uh, right-hand mud shield I picked up somewhere. And whoever was selling it at a swap meet or whatever just thought it was your typical used mud shield. But see how it has these eh, eh, eh bends in it? That is the very early style. And this, so that's an original example of exactly what's on this car. Uh, here is the pair of triplex clear door window glass. You can see I only have one of these mount pieces for a Roadster. I got a whole pile of them for a coupe, but I don't have the right hand for a Roadster. These are very good condition, original window regulators. Here is a nice set of original uh, bonnet springs. This this video is probably going to have the world record for saying the word original in it. These are early horns. I probably have some nicer ones upstairs, but I know the car that these came from, and it was an extremely early 61, just outside of outside lock. So this is exactly what you're going to want here. The part numbers are going to be right and all that. Here are some linkage pieces. This is a standard 3.8 piece. You're going to need to shorten this a little bit, but I wouldn't do it until the very end. You've got the car assembled and you can really dial in exactly what you want there because there, that's a tough fit. This is an original outside lock fiberglass glove box insert. The one that's in there right now is cardboard, but this is the real deal. Only the early cars had that. Um, here are the lenses with the fluted front. And you can see, I'm just going to give you all four of these. These are the only four non-broken ones I've managed to collect over the past few years. These two here are excellent. And then these two, I think that one's got a little mark and there's, that one might just need a little more cleaning. But there's that. So you would use this front with your standard amber back. Here are some various bags of nuts and bolts that aren't on there. You got some top frame bolts. These are the original nuts that came off the bonnet carrier. Uh, I replaced the engine mount bolts, but there's one original there. And there's a few things here. There's the gearbox bolts. Um, when I doctored up the bonnet carrier, I just put it back on with new bolts. These are all the original bolts from the bonnet carrier. And just in case some of them have uh, rusted up heads, this is a whole bag of another set of original bolts from a 61 bonnet carrier. There's all your uh, interior door handles. And then as we come down the home stretch, here are your butler's tail lamps. People go berserk over these. God only knows what they're worth. Um, here are some new uh, OBL catches that I made. The car only came with one, so I duplicated it. These are absolutely perfect. And then the grand finale of this little clip are new old stock, original bonnet, chrome, and glass. So I have three out of the four pieces in new old stock. This is how they were delivered. You can see it's in an adhesive tape that says Jaguar. It's never been peeled off. This is another new old stock. It, you can tell that it had the adhesive tape on it and was peeled off, but was never used. Okay. And then this is a real beauty here. This is the original packaging for the headlight glass. And this is an early headlamp glass. You can see it's got the triplex logo on there sideways just as it should for an early car like this. This piece was actually manufactured in June of 62, and it's got that little, uh, 
I don't know what you call it, inspection sticker on it. One's actually stuck to it, but that one doesn't have a date. And then this one here does have a date. You can see there's two different part numbers. This says, what, 329, and then that one says 328. Um, so I think this was a pair, and somebody only used one, because over here, this is just your standard piece of original uh, left-hand glass, and that new one is the right hand. So all of these will be packed up and go with it. Now there's one last part I want to show you over here on the bench. This is a standard rear top chrome for a 3.8 Roadster. This is where the top is attached to the body at the back. Now this is a piece of brass that is filled with lead, then bent to shape and chromed. Now, the, the original chrome for this outside lock car would have been a little bit different. I don't have an original, but what I do have is the raw material. That car would have had a profile like this. And you can see this is the brass with the lead inside of it. You can see that it has this little edge on the bottom. I believe that was to hook the tonneau cover to, and then later on they changed to having those little J clips under here. I actually have two pieces of this and you will get both. And what you will do is bend this to shape and then file and trim the ends and then you would have it chromed. You would also drill and countersink the holes. So you've got two pieces there in case you mess one up, but that is the correct profile. And this was used on other earlier Jags before they went to this style. Here's a shot of the bonnet open, and it really shows that more pointed power bulge that the early cars have. The bonnet is very restorable. The shape is very good. I've worked with a lot worse, so it would be a real joy to bring this one back. What is not in great shape on this car is the body shell. The body shell is going to need extensive metal work. Very bad things have been done to it in the past in the name of keeping it on the road in Canada with lots of snow and salt. You can see here, this is a piece of galvanized steel that's been wrapped around and welded up to there. I imagine it had filler on top of it at some point. There's all kinds of welded in patches. There's uh, lots of work has been done to the bulkhead, which does have some rust in it. In the back, there's rust everywhere. The floors were completely rusted out at one point and just sheets of steel have been welded in. Some are thick, some are thin. So make no mistake, the body shell needs a great deal of work. I would probably dissect this, save a few of the early components and then use them to basically build up an all new body shell. I know it's been a long video and I apologize for saying the word original 5,000 times, but that's what a car like this is all about. Like I said before, I've had this car for seven years and throughout that time, it has truly been a labor of love to collect all the pieces to make it complete. Most of what's here is original to this car, but I do have pieces in this car from my trips to Montreal, Peoria, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Alabama, uh, up and down the entire East Coast, you know, finding a, a little thing here, a little bolt, a little bracket. And as I put this together, I've mocked it up like this so that you can see that it's all there, but also so that I can see that it's all there. And in doing that, I have made sure that every little nut and bolt and washer is correct. I have buckets and boxes full of that stuff. And I can't tell you how many hours I spent with a toothbrush cleaning off GKN and B's bolts and finding 12 that matched and were the right font for a car produced during this time. And that's a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed having this car, but like I said, it's time for it to move on. Um, 
I, have, I still have my car from high school. It's right back there in the corner of the shop. And if I'm gonna be working on an E-Type for myself, which I have very little time for, it really needs to be that car. My kids are getting older. I'm spending more time with them. And so I'd love to see this car go to your shop and I will help you every step of the way. If you want to have the body shell and bonnet done here, I'd be happy to talk about that. We're booked pretty far in advance, but this is a car that I would love to do. I've been thinking about it for years, and so I'd love to stay in it in that regard. I know there's probably a lot of stuff that I missed. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I've been using this car to answer questions about outside lock E-types for seven years, and that includes helping Malcolm McKay write his recent book, which came out, uh, oh, I can't even remember. I guess it might have been two years ago now, but that was a lot of fun too. So if you'd love to dive into the ultimate E-type and you want to be an originality freak and say that you've got one of the earliest cars out there, this is a great car, and having it be that car in that iconic photo is really cool too. A lot of people have said, I'd love to find that car and get my hands on it and restore it. Well, here's your chance. Thanks for watching.